there is a saintly man named Richard Wormbrawn. He's with the Lord now. He died a few years ago at the age of 91. I had the privilege of spending time with Pastor Wormbrawn and his wife, Sabina. I've known some very godly people over the years, but never met anyone like them. They, they literally glowed with the presence of God and the love of God. But when you sat next to Pastor Wormbrown, you also saw he was terribly disfigured. You could see holes in his neck, and, and he had to sit. He, he couldn't stand for long periods of time. He and his wife were Jewish followers of Jesus in Romania. And World War II, the Nazis, and then after that, communism, Romania, they were severely persecuted. He continued to preach boldly. And he was in prison. His wife was in a slave labor camp. 14 years of prison, three years of solitary confinement. For many, many, many months, the only face he ever saw was the face of his torturers. He endured unspeakable tortures. One of the tortures was to put him in an upright coffin. The coffin doors would be closed so you cannot move a muscle. And instead of just walls, there are dagger-sharp knives from top to bottom on all sides. So the moment you flinch or move the slightest bit, you begin to bleed. And they would monitor everything through a hole in the coffin. And when he would pass out from bleeding, they would pull him out. He was burned with red-hot iron pokers from the fire. He was frozen to the point of death and then given a shot to revive him. Unspeakable things. When he was imprisoned again, he was ransomed by some believers in Scandinavia and eventually made his way over to the States. And he wanted to warn the world about what had been happening to the church under communism at that time. He wanted to share about the suffering of the believers and awaken the church in the West. He was at a home Bible study when one of my friends... An older brother, one of my friends, went to the Bible study to hear this pastor. And as he looked at the man, he said, I've never seen the character of Christ form more fully in a human being than in that man. He didn't know who was who. And then he found out, that's Pastor Wormbrown. Pastor Wormbrown shared what he shared, shared about his sufferings and the sufferings of the church under the Iron Curtain. And then my friend asked him a question. Pastor Wormbron, why is it that we do not have to deal with communism here in America? Pastor Wormbron said to him, oh, you have something far worse. You have materialism. You see, when this system would come and say to you, bow down, or we put you in prison, renounce your God, or we put you in prison, and different religions were persecuted all the same, they didn't care. Bow down to our system, deny your God, or go to prison. That's a direct assault. You understand, that's the devil. You understand, that's the enemy. You understand, to bow down to the gods of this age is to reject the God who saved you. But materialism doesn't come like that. It doesn't come and give you a command. It seduces you. It seduces me. It gets us so caught up with things that don't really matter and gets us pursuing things that are going to pass away that we don't even realize our hearts get divided. And then we get to the end of our lives we live to be 70, 80, 90 years old. We get to the end of our lives and we ask, what have I been living for? Are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Colossians chapter 3 says, if, if you have died with Christ, since you have died with the Messiah... Set your affections on things above, not on earthly things, for you die and your life is now hidden in the Messiah in God. Let me say again, thank God for provision. 
My wife and I live in a lovely home. It's a blessing if our ministry is able not just to pay our bills, but to help others and give to the poor. Thank God if he's given you a good education and you can use that as a tool. Thank God for the blessings that come. But that's not what we're living for. And that's not our focus. Our focus is, God, I want to count. I want my life to count. God, I want to glorify Jesus. Why are we here? What's our whole purpose? Is it to be a famous sports star or a famous movie star? Is it to keep climbing the social chain until we have bigger and better and bigger and better and bigger and better? Or is it to be disciples and make disciples? To know God and to make God known. When we stand before him to give account, is he going to say to you, okay, how many square feet is your apartment? Is he going to say, all right, I want to see how many degrees you earned? Is he going to say, okay, let's look at the wardrobe, make sure it's stylish. You know? Do you think any of that's going to matter? Are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? I'm not talking about living a miserable, empty life where there's no smiles and no joy and no satisfaction. I'm talking about living a full life. I'm talking about not selling out for the cheap, earthly things you're going to pass away. One of my friends did a little experiment with his daughter. He's got five kids. When his daughter was, she's in her 20s now, when she was little, he gave her a choice. He had like a stack of, of pennies. So I don't know what the equivalent would be here, but just a real cheap coin, a stack of them maybe 25 or 30 of them, and then another coin that represented 100 of them. And he asked her, which do you want? I'm going to give you money. Well, what's any little kid going to do? Take the big stack. She took the cheap stuff, the worthless stuff, because it looked like a lot, and she gave away what was really valuable. That's how some of us live our lives. I am constantly connected online because I'm constantly writing, posting articles, constantly doing videos and audio that we're posting, constantly interacting in a constructive way on social media. I'm not pursuing earthly riches. If we're blessed with a nice home, great. If our car runs, great. Or our cars, but that's not what we're pursuing. But I tell you, the distractions of the age are a new thing. I've had to make a deeper determination to, to pray with focus because I'm so easily distracted by what's online and what's happening in the world around me. There's always one thing or another or another or another vying for our attention, and we must make a determination. I'm going to live in such a way that my life makes sense in the light of eternity. I'm going to live in such a way that at the end of a year, I don't have all this regret for all the hours I wasted. I can assure you, if you had a, a favorite sports team and you didn't get to follow them that much, or a favorite TV show and you, you missed a lot of them, I can assure you, when you die and get to be in the presence of the Lord, you're not going to say, oh Lord, can I catch up on those games now? Do you have a little place, just give me like a year to watch all those TV shows I missed? In fact, you'll think, what was that? How could that captivate me so much? I was preaching in Finland one time, and the Pentecostal churches I was in were very, very conservative. Very little emotion shown, very little outward fervor in worship, very little evident fervor in prayer. One of the pastors was joking with me. He said, it's very cold here. Physically, it's very cold. He said, but in our churches, if we like your message on Sunday, we'll say amen on Wednesday. So another leader explained to me, we are just not emotional people. Now, I'm not, I'm not calling you to be emotional. No, absolutely not. I'm using an illustration. He said, we're just not emotional people. That's why we don't respond the same way. That's why we pray in such a passive way and worship in such a passive way. But it's very deep and meaningful on the inside of us. So I got up to preach after that. And I said, now I understand your culture better. When it's the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympics, and Finland 
in the last seconds of the game against Sweden, scores a goal to win the gold medal. The men who are sitting there watching say to one another, that was an amazing shot, wasn't it? <laughs> the other says, one of the more extraordinary examples of hockey skill I've ever seen. No, they're jumping up and down. They're Grown men are hugging each other and crying. I said, oh, I understand. Husbands and wives are on the verge of a divorce. Everything's falling apart in your marriage. You have an argument over dinner. I just want you to know that I, I feel deeply offended. Your words were somewhat insensitive, I would say. Yes, I too am offended, and I've calculated now this is the 31st time in the last six weeks you've been nasty to me. I think we should get a divorce. My thoughts as well. Now they're screaming at each other, they're throwing plates at each other, smashing the pictures they have of each other. Oh, but when it comes to the things of God, we are very conservative. No, they were just dry and dead, lifeless. And when the Holy Spirit began to move and they began to cry out, they responded like everybody else. We give our hearts to things that don't matter. We get so excited about things that are just going to burn up. And the things that really matter come last. How can that be? Do we really mean what we sang today? You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. See, at that moment, it seems real, doesn't it? The other themes, things seem really secondary. But then we walk away and the things of the world take over. We've got to have a focus. Whatever God gives you in this world, finances, education, position, stature, family, these are all blessed things to use as tools for the glory of God. And your family is part of a world-changing community. We are not here to be changed by the world, but to change the world. We've watched in America, if you want to know why we have the sexual anarchy and moral chaos that we have in America, if you want to know why, I can tell you why. It's because rather than the church changing the world, the world changed the church. And the sins of the society are the sins of the church. When I got saved, my life cleaned up. I'd encountered the Lord in such beauty and power and majesty that after weeks of deep conviction in my heart and wrestling back and forth and back and forth, when the love and goodness of God captured my heart, I said, that's it. I'll never put a needle in my arm again. December 17, 71, I was totally free. And then as the months went on, now my head was clear, all the drugs and everything cleared out. I was thinking clearly. And I said to myself one day, I could lead a clean but empty life or... I could give myself to God the way I gave myself to drugs and rock music. And I had to pray and get in the Word and pray and get in the Word. By the time I was saved a year, I had a light school schedule at that point. I was so in love with the Lord and so hungry for God. I spent at least six hours or seven hours alone with God every day. Read the Word two hours at least. Pray at least three hours. I'd pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit at least an hour a day. Pray another two hours. I used to memorize 20 verses a day. My mind had been so fried on drugs. Now it was supernaturally sharp and clear. In one hour, I could memorize 20 verses. Every day I'd share the gospel with someone new. I'd lay in bed at night, so overflowing with the joy of the Lord. Inexpressible and glorious joy, as Peter puts it. Peace beyond knowledge and understanding, as Paul puts in Philippians. Love beyond our grasp, as he writes to the Ephesians. I'd lay there basking. I'm, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not exaggerating. Basking in the joy and the presence of the Lord and say to myself, if my friends in school could walk in my shoes just for one day, they'd never go back to the way they were. And many of my friends came to church services and heard the gospel, and some were wonderfully saved that year. Well, now Nancy and I meet. Now we get married following the Lord together. I finished college. I started grad school. Because, see, the rabbis had challenged me. 
Rabbinic Judaism is highly educated. The, the more religious, the more education and study. So I'm talking to these rabbis. I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. They see I'm excited about the Lord. They see I know the Bible in English. But they say, how can you even talk to us? You don't even know Hebrew. How, how can you talk? You don't know Hebrew. We've been studying this since we were children. We learned it from our fathers, their fathers, all the way back to Moses. And I thought, well, I, I, I know the Lord's changed my life, but I've got to be able to answer these questions. So I started college and ended up graduating as a Hebrew major. Now Nancy and I are married. We have our first child. Now I go on to grad school. I want to continue studying. I feel I've got to learn these things for myself. But at the same time, with the busyness of life and now working a job and now having one child, now two children, and going to grad school, I was now captivated by the studies. And, and I would spend less time praying and less time reading the Word and more time learning ancient languages. I took six different languages at the same time in college, which was not a wise thing to do. Now I'm in grad school learning more languages. And, and now with it, 1 Corinthians 8, knowledge puffs up. Some pride is starting to rise. Some of the churches, they don't teach right, and Bible translations aren't that good. And now I'm really digging the original sources, and I'm good enough in school that, that I'm given a scholarship by the university so I don't have to pay for any of my classes. In fact, they give me a little bit of money each semester just to help supplement our expenses. So, you know, perfect scores basically through, through my master's, now my Ph.D. work. I'm at the top of the class. God was using these things. The knowledge was helping me in many ways. However, however, pride was entering. I was getting gradually colder spiritually. A year could go by without me fasting a single day. A year could go by without me spending a, a quality hour alone with God. Now, I'm not being legalistic about it. I'm just saying things had changed radically in terms of my devotion. I still stood strong as a witness. I was unashamed. We took poor and refugees into our homes. We, we were doing a good work in many ways, but I was getting colder. And I didn't recognize it, but I was leaving my first love. And my goals had changed. In the early days, I just wanted to burn bright for Jesus. If I live, I live. If I die, it's for him. Whatever will glorify him. Lord, I just want to make you known. I just want to be with you and make you known. And, and now the, the scholarship's going to help me do it better. But at a certain point, the goals began to change. And my goal was now, I felt it was from the Lord. I wanted to be a top scholar. I wanted to be a world-leading Hebrew Old Testament scholar and, and teach in the seminaries and improve Bible translations because I knew I was called to reach masses, but I thought, this is how I'll do it. Didn't really care to preach. I preached a little bit, but not that much. And God began to deal with me in 1982 through people close to me praying for me. I resisted because of my pride, but he began to show me how I'd left my first love. He began to remind me of what I used to have and walk in. And finally, at a meeting in October of 1982, I had finished my Ph.D. work. I was working on my doctoral dissertation. I was really challenged in a meeting. A godly gospel singer named Keith Green, he had died a few months earlier in a plane crash at the age of 28. If you've never heard of Keith Green, just look up Asleep in the Light, Keith Green. It'll stir you to this day. And I was broken over it. I went to the memorial concert, and his wife, Melody, got up and said, if more people could be reached through his death than his life, so be it. And it was a plane crash. I'm not advocating that theology, but her heart stirred me. I thought, I used to feel like that. I, that's, that used to be my heart. If I had to lay down my life for the gospel and more people would be reached, so be it. I said, but Lord, I, this is goal you've given me to, to, to achieve the scholarship and to be a top scholar and to use that for your kingdom. I feel I've got to do that now. So at the altar call that night, I said, Lord, if this has become an idol in my life, I lay it on the altar. And he burned it up. He took it. He said, what happened? Aren't you doctorate? Didn't you get the PhD? Yeah. After months and months of prayer, he gave it back to me as a tool. So I do scholarly work. I've written biblical commentaries. I've written in scholarly encyclopedias. I'm, I'm a visiting or, or adjunct professor at four different seminaries. I've written a five-volume series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. I've done debates at Oxford, outreach lectures at Hebrew University, Yale, delivered scholarly papers at Harvard. I've done that. I don't even know where the, the degrees are. They're in a closet somewhere. 
And I could care less if people esteem me or despise me. It doesn't matter because my identity is not found in having a PhD or doing this and that. My identity is found in being a servant of God. And if I get hated for it, if I get kicked out of every school for it, who in the world cares? I'm not living for the praise of man. I'm not living to impress people. Died to that. I just want to glorify God. In the 1950s, there were five American missionaries who began to reach out to a tribal people known as the Alka Indians. And that word spoke of their violence in the country of Ecuador. They had been known to kill outsiders. So these five American missionaries began to reach out to them. They, they'd fly a plane in and, and drop things for them and try to build a relationship. You can still watch an old movie about it called Through Gates of Splendor. You don't want to see the new remake, but, but the old original documentary with the old footage. The most famous of them was Jim Elliott when he was a college student at Wheaton. He said, blood is only effective when it's poured out on the altar. He said, Lord, I don't ask for a long life, but a full one like yours, Lord Jesus. What a prayer. Long life is a gift from God, but you can live a long but empty life. And you live a short life that bears fruit for eternity. Nate Saint was the name of the pilot. Well, at a certain point, they felt to build relationships that enough doors were open, and they were going to try to make contact now in a face-to-face -face way. There were some other things actually going on among the tribe and some other disputes that ended up causing people to lash out against them, and they were all killed. Five men killed. Some married with children left behind, widows and orphans. Nate Saint, the pilot, had written something sometime before he was killed, and he said this, people who do not know the Lord ask us why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. He said they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble is burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for all the years they have wasted. Eventually, some of the wives went back to live among the murderers of their husbands with their kids to lead them to Jesus. And those five lives have been bearing massive fruit, raised up a whole missions movement, brought salvation to that tribe, and on the day that we all stand before God, some of us who've lived to be 90 and have been great in the eyes of man and accumulated all kinds of riches will envy these men who died in their 20s because they gave their lives for something that counted. 